Restoring Darkness is brought to you by Devluma, illuminating the pursuit of dark skies. Welcome back to the Restoring Darkness podcast. I'm your host, Michael Colligan. And on today's show, I'm joined by Mark Baker of the Soft Lights Foundation. And we are honored to have Diane Turncheck um, join us today. Before we read her bio, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Lighting and Darkness Foundation. It's a 501c3 organization. And um, we sort of changed up a little bit, Mark, in the last little while from what we were doing before to what we're doing now. And we're a lot more focused on using our skills as lighting professionals to sort out light trespass and light to dispute disputes between neighbors. And so we've sent out letters to pe- different people that are in disputes and saying, you know, hey, we can help you mediate this because we see that this is a, a light trespass and the people in our organization are able to visit your site, take measurements and show that actually the light is not spillage. It's actually projected directly from the neighbor's property onto the other neighbor's property. And so that's a new part of the work that we're doing today. We have a couple clients in the list. We've got two already that we've sent the letters out to Mark and we got more down the down the line that are coming. And so if you want to support this kind of work, what you can do is you can go to the restoringdarkness.com website. That's right, this podcast website that you're listening to right now. And you can click the donate link. And you know what, Mark Baker? Guess what? What, Michael? We got our first <laughs> monthly donor. That's right. That's right. Somebody signed oh, up. Congratulations. To get... Yes, we've had a bunch of one-off donations here and there. But we have our first monthly donor. Thank you for that. Um, Let me read Diane's bio here. Diane is a lecturer in the Department of Physics at Carnegie Mellon University and the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Pittsburgh. She runs the Astronomy Public Lecture Series at Allegheny. Did I get that right? Allegheny Observatory. Mm -hmm. Her love of both astronomy and science fiction led her to led her to crew the Mars Desert Research Station, featured in the documentary Above and Below, where she turned her attention to dark sky advocacy and earned um, an International Dark Sky Association's Defender Award. She has given over 100 light pollution talks, including one for TEDx Pittsburgh, curated um, a series of space art galleries, and founded the Pennsylvania chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. In 2019, she edited the genre anthology Triangulation, Dark Skies with 21 Starry Night Stories. She has, rece- uh, she has been interviewed by the New York Times, PBS NewsHour, NPR Morning, NPR Morning Edition, Canada One Radio, Chinese Global Television Network, and 50 more news outlets. She hosted a Dark Skies conference at CMU and is co-running the 9th International Artificial Light at Night Conference in Calgary, Canada, while well, already hosted it in August 2023. Um, Her research focuses on measuring the light of cities with drones, aircraft, satellites, and astronauts aboard the ISS. Welcome to the Restoring Darkness podcast, Diane. So nice to be here. Thank you. Yes. And uh, I should have read all the way to the end. Yes, that that was a wonderful conference in Calgary. I heard I couldn't make it. But yes, I heard it it really went well. Um, Tell me a little bit about the pictures from the International Space Station. Now, I know in talks on this show that sometimes satellites have trouble measuring light pollution because they can't see all the spectrums in the light as well as they can see lower spectrums. They can't see the high Kelvin, higher Kelvin spectrums, and that's a problem with LED because most of the outdoor LEDs are of the higher Kelvin. Tell me why these pictures from the International Space Station are so important. Um, my student they were high school students at the time, applied to the ISS to have astronauts take pictures. And I thought it was more of a publicity stunt than anything else to say like, the eyes of the world are on you and out of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right, the, the best satellites we have, like the Veers satellite cuts off the blue end of the spectrum, and that is a lot where the higher temperature LEDs are. Uh, but the astronauts are taking photographs with a digital camera out the porthole, so it's hard to get down at the nadir exactly, mm-hmm. and they're moving really fast. So the last time they came by Pittsburgh, when it was clear, which is not that often, they took two like snap, snap, one right after each other, 
and one was like before Pittsburgh and the other one was almost past Pittsburgh. So it's, it's a very difficult thing to get their pictures, but if, if they do and when they do, which they have hit it right, um, it's, it's phenomenal. It's so clear and crisp and you can see all the colors. So it is something that I think is an important thing to do. It was probably five years by the time, from the time we asked to the time they started taking the pictures, hmm. which is okay because Pittsburgh's changing out its streetlights and the process has been taking a while. It still hasn't started, won't start for another year. The, do we have an issue with measuring light pollution? I, I've talked to many people and they say there are different ways, but there's no standard metric for measuring light pollution. Am I correct about that? Yeah, it's very difficult, especially when you're entering the field. You don't know where to start. I mean, SQMs, the sky quality meters, that's fine. But there are the SQM plain ones and the Ls and the LUs, and each of them is a little different. And you have to take maybe five readings, throw out the first one, average the rest, because they're not very accurate. and even at that point, they're still not very accurate. And then over the years, the sensors degrade and, and you get a change in the uh, numbers you're getting. So not the best. Um, I have test photometers, uh, test-w photometers, which are designed by astronomers themselves to measure sky glow. I also have an all-sky camera that has a 340 view of the sky and takes pictures like continuously dusk to dawn. Um, but there's a lot of ways of doing it. That's why we did so many things, the helicopter and the aircraft and the drones, because we were trying to figure out what is the best way. And great, great down, excellent way to go. But, um, a helicopter is the way to go for a city like Pittsburgh. So we found a company that can, in four hours, cover the whole city. And you mm -hmm. need a, a short block of time like that because you don't want to start at eight at night and then go to three in the morning because you're, you know, there's a different amount of light. Mm -hmm. So that's our next goal is to take a complete light pollution map of Pittsburgh before the street lights get changed and then after the streetlights get changed. And then I have, oh well, everybody has the map they can use, whatever their specialties, health, you know, bird migration, whatever the scientists are studying, they'll have a before and after map. And also I can draw a line. So I can take the city and we're, we're starting to do this already is go outside the city and see where the dividing line is where you can not see the Milky Way and then see the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. So that's like a ring. It's actually more like an amoeba around the city. Mm -hmm. And then after the street lights get changed, I'm hoping that shrinks. That's the goal. Shrink the ring so that more people can see the Milky Way. So that's the my goal. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful goal. Um, the you know before we get into more of the Pittsburgh, like I want to talk more about this measurement. I find that when I speak to astronomers, they're always trying to measure from the ground up. So they have instruments mm -hmm. looking at the sky. They're photographing the sky. They're measuring light coming in from the sides on different sensors, and then you know. Um, this, there's different sky conditions, and so they have a whole bunch of different factors. And then what they do is they, they, they plot that for years and years and years, and then they, they take measurements. Like, um, I can't remember his last name, but Remy from Montmagantic in Quebec, he was telling me about his measure and how they've actually decreased light pollution in that area using his metric. And then I find a lot of lighting people are always trying to look from the top down. And so you have like this idea of the satellites or pictures from the International Space Station. And it seems like the lighting folks are trying to look down on light pollution and the astronomers are trying to look up at, at the sky and measure stuff coming in from the side. Do you have the same experience on that? And which way do you think we should go? People will come to an agreement at some point. Uh, that's 
the point of the Allen Conference, the Artificial Light at Night Conference that happens every other year somewhere in the world. It It's bringing the lighting people and the astronomy people and policy and social sciences and biology. And uh, so it's trying to bring everybody together so we get on the same page because you're right. That is one of the biggest problems right now is everybody's using a different measurement and and we're not going to move forward until we at least can get on the same page about this and be accurate in the measurements too. So mm. the the paper that came out last January, uh, Chris Kaiba and Connie Walker and two other people whose names I'm forgetting, um, over a decade, light pollution increased globally 9.6%. Um, they were using a completely different method. So the method they used was globe at night, which was here are six or seven charts with one constellation and everybody, all the citizen scientists do this one thing at the same time, look at the sky, count how many stars you can see in a particular constellation. Can you see down? Can you see this star? Can you see that star? Oh, well, then you're at a level something. So, I mean, from where I teach in the middle of the city, you can see first magnitude stars and maybe some second magnitude stars. It's not very good. Perfectly clear night, maybe 50 stars altogether. Hmm. But um, but this method, it's, it's great in that you're getting people involved, you're getting people excited about it, but also... You know, there's a lot of factors there. Like you said, there could be some high cirrus that people don't notice, or uh, their eyesight could be bad, or <laughs> like there are many things that could be standing just slightly too close to a light. Or sure. Uh, well, one of the one, really one of the biggest thing. impacts of looking at the sky is the light immediately around you. And so when I counsel people that if you want to take a look at the stars, make sure all the lights on your in your home or at your cottage or whatever in the living room are off and ask your neighbor, call your neighbor and tell him to turn his off too. Like those are the biggest impacts are the ones right next to you. So um, tell me a little bit about the Pittsburgh LED streetlight conversion and and what we should know about that. Is it different? Are they using a lower Kelvin temperature in the in the bio and the notes here? It says advocating for amber. Are they going to use twenty two hundred Kelvin? Are they are they going to be shielded? Are they going to be pointed straight down? Tell me a little bit about what's happening in Pittsburgh. So it started when Mayor Bill Peduto took office, and I was on his transition team. I was many years ago. And I just kept talking about dark skies, dark skies. Well, one of the people on that transition team remembered Grant Irvin, and he put in, he wrote up and put in the dark sky ordinances. He was the city's uh, resiliency officer. He has now left, but the dark sky ordinances were voted in by the city council and they're in place 20, 2021. So they say going forward, all the parks and facilities and playgrounds have to use dark sky compliant lights when they make a, a change or a new building, major renovation, and all the things that are sitting on city property, which is big. It's the National Aviary. It's the zoo. It's Phipps Conservatory. And uh, so all those places and they are all bound to follow these ordinances. Now that mayor left, a new mayor came in, he has different priorities, but they are, they're trying not to lose momentum. So they gave $2.24 million to a company called The Efficiency Network to design the streetlights. And they have till next summer to come up with their design. I, I've talked to them recently, they're, they're still surveying streetlights, learning about different kinds of streetlights. Uh, the last time I talked to them, they were looking at 2,500 Kelvin streetlights. Uh, so I don't know much more about that. There's 40,000 of the high pressure sodium that have to get changed. And then maybe 5,000 really terrible 
LEDs that were put in a decade ago. So they're probably getting to near the end of their lives. Those are at 5,000 Kelvin. So, uh, so there may be 45,000 lights to change. And then they might add some, but as the people at 10, because it's called 10, say two. <laughs> like it's, it's, it depends. But uh, what, what's going on right now is uh, surveys to understand, because we don't, the city of Pittsburgh does not own all the poles. The electric company owns the poles and we mm -hmm. rent the poles. Mm -hmm. So some metal poles, some wooden poles, and we have to, uh, we already had a contract with the electric company, so we had to revise the contract. Um, but it will save at least a million dollars a year after we change, maybe two or three million dollars, which is great, <laughs> just because LEDs are so much more efficient. Full cutoff is what you asked about. Mm -hmm. So some of the shielding in the dark sky ordinances is, is not full cutoff because where the street lights are, they're they're fixed, they're in a position, and the engineers want to throw the light between them mm -hmm. so it's more uniform. So they're they're going to be as shielded as they can be without leaving like black stripes on the roads. Mm. So I kind of like the dark ovals. Like like the light ovals and then a little bit of darkness because it gives it more of a um, depth perception. Yeah, I agree with you. you. Know, when you, I I don't like it when it's completely uniform. But um, there's evidence of, and I'm going to put this over to Mark here, but I believe there is evidence emerging that high uniformity, high Kelvin temperature LED street lights with lots of glare actually reduce visual acuity. Mark, do you want to jump in on that and have a few questions for Diane? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Hi, Diane. Um, Hi. So the Soft Lights Foundation and me personally have been involved with Pittsburgh. So it's an inter interesting coincidence that we're talking about this. So two or three years ago, I was working with a colleague from the Sierra Club, and uh, he taught me how to analyze all the data. Uh, and so we got a hold of the Pittsburgh uh, data uh, and their claims that they were making and uh, the amount of money that they would save. And there was a lot of uh, stuff that really didn't pan out. So there was a lot of marketing claims uh, about, and then there was these surprising facts, such as they were gonna start adding extra street lights uh, into neighborhoods in the name of like equity, uh, which is sort of like, so there's, there was this money available and then they were gonna say, add, uh, add street lights. And, that seems bizarre. If you're trying to reduce your energy costs, then why would you be adding street lights? Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, the the dark sky protections, and I and you know when we start when I first started a couple of years ago, three thousand Kelvin was like this magic number from the American uh, Medical Association, and the Dark Sky Association had that three thousand Kelvin number, but uh, I think in 2021, it got switched to 2200 Kelvin by at the United Nations. Uh, the Dark Sky Association signed on to that. Uh, you're shaking your head as if you're familiar with that, which is great. But so. We lost Mark. Scott. Mark, you're on mute. That issue. Oh, there he's back. We had, you went on mute there for a second. Good. Okay. Diane, so there's there's 2200 Kelvin uh, and 3000 Kelvin on the Dark Sky Association website. Um, I, the question is like, so when you're dealing with the city of Pittsburgh, which number do you choose? So Pennsylvania has a bill coming up for vote tomorrow <laughs> that has 2200 Kelvin across the entire state. Mm. Wow. I know. It's called the Responsible Outdoor Lighting Act. And we've all been writing furiously to our, um, you know, all the people on the bill uh, and who are in the committee. Uh, let's see. This was, there were a bunch of them. Pielli, Madden, Hills, Evans, Howard, Vemcat, Sanchez, 
Malagari, Haddock, Schusterman, Green, Otten, Probate, Diamond, and Borowski were the ones that originally uh, made the bill. And then it went to committee on Halloween. And it's already getting voted on, which is amazing to me. That's way so quickly. But this is well written. It's really good. I am hopeful that people are uh, on board. They seem to be, it's, it seems to be a bipartisan issue. Everybody wants to save money and you know, make headlines and, you know, get, get a, I'm a good guy badge. <laughs> so, um, so we will see. Um, I, I would think that that's the first in the country uh, to do 2200 Kelvin. Yes, that would be. Wow, that would be very exciting. I look forward to that. After this show, I'm going to uh, pay attention to that. Uh -oh. um, so another question yeah. I have for you then is, um, you know, there is a, there's been a switch to LEDs, but does it really have to be LEDs? Uh, in my understanding, low pressure sodium is the most energy efficient, the softest, gentlest, best if we're going to have light at all. Uh, outdoors. Low pressure sodium has the highest luminous efficacy at 180 or 200 lumens per watt. Um, do you support the the installation or uh, why not use LPS? Uh, can I answer that for Diane from the Lighting and Darkness I was Foundation's say, perspective? <laughs> that, yeah, that I, and I, I've talked to Mark a couple. I've, I've talked about I've talked about, with Mark about this before. So LPS is not manufactured anymore. There's nobody that makes that that light source any longer. Um, there may be some legacy, but there's no major manufacturing for it. The ability to know how to manufacture it is largely lost. And on top of that, it's a mercury containing lamp. And so you have two stars shooting towards each other. You know, one is energy efficiency, the other is toxic, uh, hazardous waste, and they're gonna collide in this perspective. And so you're gonna see, what you're gonna see from lighting regulations largely is um, we're moving away from energy efficiency and. Dar um, darkness restoration and night preservation is a form of energy efficiency. It's not lumens per watt based, it's quality of light based, but you're going to see that emerge out of the energy efficiency and it's going to collide with the elimination of mercury and lighting. And those two things are going to go together. And so LPS is, sorry, Mark, but I know your soft lights, I'm lighting and darkness foundation, the lighting industry, that's never going to happen. So that's great. I, I understand the lumens per watt and the FSK, uh, but the visual acuity of low pressure sodium is absolutely at atrocious. So well, we have a number of observatories I think that use uh, the low pressure sodiums around their observatories. Yeah, I, Arizona they... is a heavy is a heavy low pressure sodium state, but you know the the I, I sell a, the average light bulb that's low, and I want to go back to Diane here because we could do another podcast on this, but just the two of us. <laughs> Low pressure sodium is over, bud. Are you going to have to just bury it, put it in the cemetery? Diane, I want to move back back over to, it's just not realistic, Mark. I know, I it, it, just laying it down. Um, the it, the um, environmental justice piece, I don't know what that means. So before you tell me how it applies to, you know, night preservation or starry skies or darkness restoration, can you tell me what environmental justice is first? And then we'll move into how it applies to this issue. So this was back in the 1900s. People realized that poorer people lived near toxic waste dumps and noise polluting factories viewing out toxic air pollution. Mm. And why? Because that was what they could afford. Um, so right away, I mean, lots of presidents throughout the years have made you know, statements about it. Reagan and Clinton put out words that said, "We this is unacceptable. We can't have this happening. And so a lot of government money has gone into trying to channel and study what is and what isn't environmental pollution. So it went from just toxic waste to, you know, food deserts and access to healthy mm. food and just lots of things started to be in that umbrella. And light pollution has entered that also. So twice as bright 
in areas where there are Hispanic, um, Asian, and Black, those three going twice as bright to not quite as twice as bright in the cities that have been studied. And why is that? They're targeted by law enforcement. That is basically it. Also, when politician spends money in a neighborhood for the sake of spending money in a neighborhood, what is better than to have a big bright thing that says, look at what I just did. It's in your face. Oh, the mm -hmm. mayor just did that. So a lot of times the, the money is being spent in the neighborhood and even to the point where if you ask the residents what they want, let's face it, people want brighter mm -hmm. lights, Yep. especially in unsafe neighborhoods mm -hmm. because they feel safer. And they're not safer. <laughs> There's no good studies that show a correlation between mm -hmm. are you actually safer or are you just a brighter target? But they want brighter lights. And so you you really need to do an educational part before you ask people what they want and explain what all the choices are instead of just saying check a box oh they all said lights so it's it's a real problem because when you want to have a dark sky area an urban area there's a lot of pools of worry people have. Where's my next paycheck and my food and my mm -hmm. kids' safety and my car, this bill, rent, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things to worry about. And getting cancer in 20 years is like, that's not in that immediate pool mm -hmm. of worry. So a lot of people just don't even want to hear about it. This is not, doesn't deal with me right now. It's, it's not important. I have other really important things to deal with. I get it. I understand that. But I feel that, you know, there's so many positive things about mm. restoring darkness. It's a it's a win, 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 right? It's better for human health. It's better for the environment. Mm. Plants, animals are adversely affected by it. It's better for your pocketbook, you know, and, and not spending money means you didn't have to create that energy in the first place. So it's better for climate change. And, you know, glare, terrible issue. So safety and glare go together. Um, you're, you're finding all the different parts and pieces are wins. So if you explain it like that, then people are like, well, I like fish, <laughs> frogs, turtles, or whatever, dung beetles. I was talking to somebody and she said, hmm. I love dung beetles. <laughs> So, I mean, dung beetles roll the little piles of dung away from the dung heap by the Milky Way. Hmm. That's how they navigate. Get out of here. And if you take away the Milky Way, the dung beetles just roll their little pile of dung in circles. Oh. <laughs> and then that's part of the, you know, that's, that's so part sad. of the natural breakdown of the environment. I mean, we need them to to take away the waste. That's part of the circle of life. Hmm. So I forgot the Diane, question. <laughs> um, uh, it's okay. Diane, I'll ask you something else. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> yesterday in the New York times, an article came out uh, that pedestrian deaths have been increasing over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Hmm. And yeah, I I in the that. article, hmm. you read that. Okay. So in the article, they were not, uh, they were looking for why. And uh, when I say uh, that the deaths increased, it was only at nighttime. These pedestrian deaths were only at nighttime. Hmm. Um, and so there were all these different possibilities. There were people moving to the Sun Belt, uh, larger vehicles, and they were all reasonable. But completely missing from uh, that article was any mention of glare from LEDs. They so had one uh, there were, they had, oh, I missed it. I, there was <laughs> yeah, okay. there was, it was right uh, near the end. It said, uh, Oh my gosh, I'll have to go back and, and reread. <clears throat> the only place where they felt that more light was necessary was in intersections of pedestrian crossings. 
I, um, but there was a list of, <clears throat> excuse me, experts uh, listed on that article. And so um, there's a website, which I can't, it's, it's not, not a nice name, but it's on Reddit. And they're collecting evidence, uh, photos and videos of this glare. So people are frequently posting on it. Hmm. So I collected 10 of those and <clears throat> I sent them to these experts and I said, hey, there, here's this uh, glare. Um, and I got one response back already. He said, oh, we hadn't thought of that. So <clears throat> what I was wondering was, it seems to me that with the, the LED switch and the high color temperature and this incredible luminance and incredible blue with the, that the glare is increased everywhere, that um, could it be used to discuss uh, protecting the dark sky, protecting our view of the stars is associated with also you know, saving pedestrians as they're walking across the street. Right. I, I thought the article had a lot of interesting stuff in it that I would never have thought of. Like only in the U.S. are deaths increasing. And why is that? Well, people in the U.S. are on their phones a lot. I see people walking with their phones constantly in the city. There are you know, there's a lot of marijuana legalization now and hmm. opiate, opioids are very high. And that was also mentioned as part, hmm. a possible part of the problem. Um, speeds are high. Cars are fast. Cars are bigger. I think glare is certainly an issue. And I think we can own that one by saying that we need full cutoff lighting. You know, we need it. This way, a 45 degree angle down, mm. not just horizontal, because then pedestrians and drivers still see the glare. But I do, I do think that's an important thing that you brought up. Maybe we should write, since the article just came out, we should write a letter to the editor. And I bet that would, because those things are timely. <laughs> if it's five days go by, you've lost your window. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's a thing that we should do and get that in there quickly. You know, um, the, one of the, the, it's probably a mixture of frailties. You know, when you're, when you're looking at an issue like that, it's very complex. Um, there's probably a host of different things contributing to the problem, you know, drug addiction, vagrancy, phone use, you know, chronic cannabis use, um, glare from headlights and other cars, these LED glares and headlights along with LED glare from the street lights. There's probably a whole bunch of things that are going on together. And to try to pick one of them and run with it is, is probably a bad policy decision. It's probably better to continue to look at, at what the, what the, the, all the contributors to the problem are. But we have to get rid of Mr. Straw Man. You know, Mr. Straw Man, that more light and the higher, the whiter, the better. That guy's got to go away. Because... In this arena, I always find that the, you know, um, whether it's the police officers that I've interviewed on this show that tell me that, no, 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 we have tons of evidence that, that, you know, more light reduces crime. Well, what kinds of crime, right? It just creates different kinds of crime. And so we know that light is neither the cause of crime nor the solution, but we also know that it creates different kinds of crime. And so, you know, we need to understand the issue better. And this idea um, that you brought up with the environmental justice, I'm just going to loop back to that for a second. You know, when, you're, when you ask people in these neighborhoods, they always want more light. You know, and th that, was the, that was the issue with the keyhole to keyhole strategy that the mayor of Chicago had for a while, where he wanted the lights to be crossing over the keyholes. Right? But I think the end, resu the end result <laughs> is like people are living in a prison yard. And they... You, you know, like they're li literally, I mean, the, the, the way that they could direct these things to be like that. And so there has to be some sort of psychological impact. So you have this push and pull between, you know, people who are poor that are more day to day focused, trying to make, make the rent at the end of the month and give their kids a lunch. And, you know, people saying, well, you got too much light outside your house. That's your biggest problem. <laughs> like it, it's sort of, it, it seems a, a <laughs> A little bit sort of like, um, go back to the Hamptons, buddy, and get your dark skylighting. You know, in this neighborhood, we're good. 
You know, there's an element of that in this issue that seems like it's kind of fancy schmancy. How do we overcome that on the environmental justice side? How do we show people how valuable this is? I think what we need to do is we need to put a story to it. So here you are, you're in your apartment. It's hot. You want to leave your window open to get a cool breeze at night. But you can't because there's a street light right outside, same height as your window mm. on the second, third floor, shining right onto your pillow you could read. On the other hand, some of the neighborhoods in Pittsburgh, there are lots of trees between the street and houses back from the road. They have lots of money for, you know, dark window coverings. And they have air conditioning that they can run up a high bill on that they don't care. Mm -hmm. So it's people who are in the first scenario that should care more about proper lighting. Yeah, it's a tough problem. You know, it, you know, for, for example, in what we saw, I had a previous host named John Bullock, who was in London. And, you know, they, the richer areas of London were upgrading, or he was in England, but not in London, but. The richer areas of, of England upgraded their lights to LED first. And then the, then the poorer areas got through LED lights. And then the richer areas started to upgrade to dark sky friendly lights. Right? And it's like, well, that's yeah. not fair. But I, I think that this, I mean, I've done, uh, you know, many, many Restoring Darkness podcasts, hundreds and hundreds of Get a Grip on Lightning podcasts. And I'll tell you, I still don't know what to do. And Mark Baker and I talk and email each other all week long trying to figure out how to help people and solve this problem. So I, I you know, I, while it's, I agree with you that there's an element of that poor neighborhoods seem to be let up like prison yards more often. And richer neighborhoods seem to very quickly get on to the latest trend of 3,000K and then 2,200K and then cut off and shield it. And it seems to happen very quickly. Isn't that the natural progression of everything? Because the richer neighborhoods are going to pay a heck of a lot more per streetlight if they do that. And so there's like an early adopter cost and, and that we need to have in, into there. Is there any other way out of this other than the storytelling, which... You know, as much as I love it, I, I'm not sure it's going to have a huge impact, you know. Um, it's almost like we need to tell people what they need and then but give them what they want anyway. I, 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 it, it's, it's such a difficult issue to, to pass on to people that hey, what you want is less light. That is so counterintuitive to everybody. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of foreign students that come to Carnegie Mellon. <clears throat> and... You know, they're coming from Bangkok and Singapore and, and they're terrified when they get here. Um, one of my students, we did a study a, a summer ago and he found that the brightest places in the city corresponded to the youngest uh, people, it's college, it's college students. Our campus is one of the brightest places in the city. And yet when these students come, they are so scared. And they have asked the president of the university to put big, tall poles with floodlights to make a white light dome over not just the campus, but the surrounding areas where students might live. Like, hoping these students graduate soon. <laughs> <laughs> and move on somewhere else because that's you know they're they're afraid and countering people's fears is a really difficult thing i i have a fear i have a bunch of kids and i'm afraid something's going to happen to them that's my pretty much only fear <laughs> going forward um i don't understand why people are afraid of like literally anything so I'm not a good one to ask about this. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, the, we do that fear. That fear is real, mm -hmm. and so it has to be uh, somehow dealt with. Uh, you can't just say, "Well, get over it." It's, <laughs> it's, it's you can't just in yeah. one day not be afraid. <laughs> uh, but there's these health effects. Putting the white light all across campus is going to make everybody sick. It's uh, increasing their risk of 
you know, long-term cancer and diabetes. And the health effects are quick, actually, right? To have that light there will, uh, you know, uh, increase their risk of getting all these diseases and you know, there's all kinds of bad things. So, so somehow the president of the university needs to go back to the students and say, I hear you you're afraid, we want to protect you, here's what we're going to do, but it's not going to be light. That's not how we're going to keep you safe. Well, you know what? There's you know, all these health risks. Yeah, you know you know what? I, I read a study from, from Paris or France or something like that recently. Well, no, it appeared in the Darkness News Update. So if you're listening to this and you want to get all the hot blasts, you don't want to read everything like me, you just want to hear the headline, you listen to the Darkness News Update with Scott Wachter. Comes out every two weeks and has all the news in English in the world on this topic. But um, there was a study where instead of, um, instead of dimming or brightening the lights or anything, when they changed the lights, they added controls and gave the neighborhood an app. And the people in the neighborhood could control their own lights. And so they said, yeah, what's going to happen is uh, if nobody says to keep the lights on, the lights are just going to go down by 90% and dim down. And don't worry about it. If you want to be able to control, if you want to have more light, you just open the, you know, whatever neighborhood in Paris app, you know, whatever you pick one, Saint-Germain or something like that. And you can turn on the streetlights in your neighborhood and it'll stay on for 25 minutes and then it'll slowly dim again and warm. So it'll go to white and then it'll warm and dim slowly. So it tunes and warms slowly down, down, down. And they found that people never turned the lights on. They were happy with the light level they had and that the ability to control it was enough to ease the, the, the fear wow that they had in, in eliminating the light and that when they, when they had these lower levels of light level, they thought it was fine. And, you know, they just accepted it. And so I, I think the app went largely unused was really the outcome of the, of the situation. And so, yes, there's this, there's a, th- th- we, we have these perceptions as humans, diurnal species, you know, f- afraid of the wolves and the bears and all the creatures that were out there at night as we evolved. And we gathered around fires and we sat close to fires around our loved ones and our fathers and our brothers and our moms who would protect us from the real dangers that were out there at night. And there's still real dangers out there at night. But I don't know if lighting everything out there does anything about that. You know, it, it's just a perception. It's um, a flawed Evolu- biologically evolutionary. It's like the dung beetles. You know, the dung beetles, they, nobody trains a dung beetle how to roll its poop around. You know what I'm, or roll around in the poop. It just knows that I, it, like genetically evolved to relate to the Milky Way. That's an amazing. Think about how incredible life is. And I think humans have genetically evolved to desire light at night. And the bigger the fire, the better. You know, it's warmer, it fends off more beasts of wild and ram- other tribes of humans that might attack us. And I think that that's the issue is that we're like the dung beetle. We've evolved to a preference for light at night. And this preference is causing us problems now, Diane. You, you said so many things I want to comment on. Thank you. That, that was beautiful. Um, dimming for one thing, is so critical. I mean, you must know this more than I do, but there are a lot of places that want to put in lights and they want to just run them at max and have no dimming capabilities. And that is so bad because you're not going to add them later. Let's face it. If mm-hmm. you don't put them in when the lights go in, there's no way that you're going to mm-hmm. know, raise the money to do it later. And if I'm right, if you put them at half brightness, they'll last twice as long Mm. and they'll cost half as much (laughs) to Mm -hmm. operate Mm -hmm. and they won't need as much maintenance. So having them not running at full blast is really optimal. And if there's an incident in the area, a car accident or something, brighten them up. Great. And then when it's Mm -hmm. done, you put them back down again. Mm -hmm. And also what a lot of people have told me they did that worked is when they put the new lights in, they put them at the brightness of the old lights and then slowly Mm. over months, they bring them down and Mm. down and down to the level where, you know, the appropriate level and nobody notices and nobody complains. You can do that over five minutes and no one would notice. (laughs) 
I'm not kidding you. Because, really? yeah, because your eye adjusts, yeah. right? There's yeah. a certain, there's a certain yeah. pace at which you can't go any faster then. But if you do it slow enough, people won't even, you can warm it and you can dim it. And people won't even notice that that's happening as long as you keep the pace right. correctly. Like think about the principles of theatrical lighting, right? Like how do we use theatrical lighting? You go to a theater, you sit down, all of a sudden there's a shh and then the lights start to go down. Everyone's cued to be quiet because the lights are being dimmed, right? And you're, and you're you know, that's too fast, right? Because people notice it. Right. But if you uh, sat there, if you were okay. sitting in that theater and the lights were starting to dim, you probably wouldn't notice it. But you might look at your watch like th there's a study from PNNL where they um, uh, they were waking up um, mothers in a hospital. And instead of going and waking them up, they would just start the light at twenty two hundred Kelvin, very dim, and then slowly raise it over the course of 45 minutes and everyone would wake up naturally. And then at the end of the night for visiting hours, instead of telling everybody visiting time is over, they would just half an hour before it, they would start to warm the light and dim it. And people would start to go, guess what? It's time to go home. But they wouldn't notice that the lights were being dimmed, which is the interesting part. <laughs> they had the signal that this was happening. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, we have wonderful Bluetooth control systems for inside. I haven't seen anything for municipal street lighting. It's a tragedy. Yeah, well, the money is on indoor lighting. So that's where the focus has been in the past. Mm. So we'll try, to, we'll try to change that. There's so many perceptions, the whole cultural shift that we need, that brighter is better, and the, the idea that you're safer, and the idea that um, it's progress, it's, it's, you know, excitement, and like fireworks going off, and that it means the city's alive and prosperous. We kind of have to change that. And something that um, I traveled after the Allen conference this summer to places that were very dark and it was beautiful. But I found that no one appreciated it in these little towns all across Oregon. Nobody appreciated that they had a beautiful dark night sky. And when I tried to tell them about astro tourism, they were like, I, we don't understand, <laughs> but that's got to be the next, next biggest boom. And I'm counting on those people who are going to make money on this to help spread the word. I mean, you, if you have a beautiful natural resource above you and you're not using it, uh, I don't know, you, people should be taking advantage of it more. Well, Utah on their license plate says darkest skies in America, I think. Does it really? Yes, oh. I think so. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so it is happening and there is um, more dark sky tourism going on. But you know who the real money makers are? And after I ask you this, I'll throw it over to Mark. Um, the real opportunity is for the lighting industry. Okay, so the, the, the people that, like everyone talks about this and uh, international dark sky or dark sky or whatever, this guy, if we're going to fix this, it's going to be by the people who work in the lighting industry, lighting distributors, contractors, manufacturers. And this is a massive, massive money making opportunity. And all we have to do, Diane, is say, yeah, we screwed this up really bad and we have to change it all. I agree. Mark, final questions for Diane? Well, there was, there was two uh, totally different topics, so I'm not sure how to approach it. Maybe <laughs> I'll just throw out both to you, Diane, and you choose one, okay? Or you could choose both. <laughs> so one was about my – I have a concern about the dimming. My concern is flicker. Oh, flicker. Um, yeah. With, uh, yeah, with the digital LEDs, we have a number of members in our group that are very sensitive to the digital flicker. And I don't 100% know all the details on how they dim but if you dim it by pulsing and on, off, on, off, so it looks dimmer, but it's not actually dimmer, uh, there's a major neurological problem with that. So that would be a concern I would some, I hope that people address. Uh, a second totally different topic was that I saw this video yesterday, and you may have seen this before, but there's this tree in the city, you know, it could be Pittsburgh, and it's under a street light, and it's coming towards fall. And the leaves that are not under the light are 
yellow and brown and they're getting ready to drop off mm -hmm. and then the, the leave right not the whole tree but just right under the light they're still green um mm -hmm. and so i know that's that cities want to have you know, they're spending money actually to take care of that tree and keep it healthy and stuff. And then they're sticking this toxicity right on top of it. It sort of a, doesn't make sense. Maybe you'd like to speak to either of those issues to finish. Yes. Um, the flicker, I, I do recognize that that's a problem. And there are people who have trouble going out at night and they're bound in their houses after dark if they live in an area with lots of LEDs. And I feel for them and that's that's the so lighting industry has to deal with that because i don't understand like what the flicker is caused by or anything but it's a real issue and people should get on that um the tree i wish i had a picture of that because i'm i'm constantly on the lookout for that i've seen ones where it's like in a parking lot and half of it's bad and half of it's good uh it stresses the tree so in a latitude that we're at 40 degrees north latitude trees get their cues two ways temperature and length of day and length of day is more important at our latitude not everywhere on the planet but for us the length of day and the extension of the day into the night by having an artificial light on the tree is is what really affects it and it stresses the trees and they don't they're not as healthy and that allows disease and insects to just ravage them so it is it is a major problem we're trying to be a biophilic city right bring nature into the city rewild the city let's have a wonderful tree cover so squirrels can jump from treetop to treetop like they used to so up lighting trees why, why would anybody do that and it just it there are things that this podcast is great at educating people and articles, like especially there have been some really nice ones in popular places like uh, Joshua Sokol wrote a nice one about the dung beetles in the New York City, New York, uh, New York Times. But getting out there and getting the word out and getting people on board and being cool people who are talking about this. Mm -hmm. I, I know that I'm not trying to blow my own horn, <laughs> but I want to be a person that people look up to and say, well, if Diane says it, well, then I want to be there too. And I, I look for opportunities to talk. I look for, you know, I, I say, yes, Every time a reporter asks me, I say yes. And then if they're asking about something else, like Canadian public radio, they want to talk about a meteor that flew over Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And of course, I would, I brought in, I actually had to say, wait, 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 at the end to the reporter who was wrapping up and say, we would see more incoming asteroids and near Earth asteroids and meteors if we didn't have so much light pollution, it mm -hmm. is dangerous to light up our skies and then astronomers get blinded and we can't see dangers to the planet. Like I put it in everything that I get asked to talk about. And I've talked, I've talked a lot. Last two years I've talked, you take all the articles and podcasts and documentaries and print and TV and radio, and you add up all the subscribers to places that have interviewed me, it comes out to 1.2 billion people. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Wow. Well, you know, um, before we sign off, I'm just going to comment on the dimming and flicker issue. So Mark makes an astute point, and we shouldn't be trying to dim existing light fixtures, even if they say dimmable. The technical term is temporal light modulation. And what happens is if LEDs are run at AC instead of DC, they literally turn on and off 100 times a second, uh, 60 times a second. With fluorescence in the past, they wouldn't turn off. They would go from 100 to 70%. But LEDs go from 0 to 100 
And this flicker, as they triac dim them, triac dimming is a type of dimming with it, you know, your wall dimmer for incandescence. What it does is it lowers that frequency so the dimming becomes more and more visible. Okay. Um, we're going to get over this and we're going to dim the light fixtures. We're going to fix it, Mark. I promise you. I'm telling you right now. I'm going to make a call. In the next show, I'm going to have an answer for you. Yeah. This one doesn't have temporal modulation, light modulation when it dims. And, you know, um, I'm so grateful for your work, Diane. And um, I really love what you're doing. And I think you're 100% correct. Um, you know, actually, I'll say it at the end. You finish up your final thoughts and then I'll sign off with, with the, what I learned from you today. <laughs> So there's actually um, something that just came out from the European Union. Light pollution mitigation measurements measures for environmental protection. It's a 75-page <laughs> article all about the, the, the whole field, everything about it. Um, and I'm... I'm really happy this publication for the European Union put this out. I will send you a link and maybe you want to find somebody to talk about it next time. But I know of two authors who are now writing light pollution books. And I, I, the one just came out and there's many others in the pipeline. And I think that would be something to promote if people would get on board and let's have a lot of them. Let's have a glut on the market. Let's have a whole section in the bookstore Boom. <laughs> about books about light pollution. <laughs> I think that would be fun. Um, I think the young people are an untapped group who obviously, you know, they're making big waves when it comes to climate change. And who did we rob the stars from them so they they are a loud voice i think coming up in the future and this is going all the way down to middle school students so you you we should be doing more with them working with them to try to bring back their stars i mean i'm like the last generation where you could just walk outside your house wherever you lived in the world and look up and see <laughs> It's, you know, you know, this, this whole thing is leaving our consciousness, mm. our, our group global consciousness. So uh, we're, we're also on tap to try to fix this. So. But I, education, that's kind of key. But as an astronomer, I just want data. And that's, that's my goal is to make some really powerful data uh, maps and things. Thanks for well, having me on. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. No, it has, it, this is what the Restoring Darkness podcast does, and I'm so glad to have Mark Baker with me from Soft Lights. He always disagrees with me on lighting stuff, but then we come together on other areas. But that's what it's all about. But you know what? What I learned from Diane today, folks, listeners, is that all the cool kids in lighting are getting into night preservation and darkness restoration. What are you waiting for? Get over here. All the cool kids are doing this now. Are you still selling old nasty wall packs? And I'll get out of here. What are you talking about? <laughs> and of course, thank you for listening. But before you go, if you want to support the Letting in Darkness Foundation, you go to restoringdarkness.com. You can volunteer. You can join. If you're a lighting distributor, you, or you can join Nailed. Or you can donate. There's nothing wrong with becoming a monthly donor. And of course, we want you to check out softlights.org, Mark Baker's organization. And most of all, thank you for listening and helping us spread this awareness and this message to the world. Bye for now. Look no further for dark sky friendly products than Evluma. Since its first product launch, Evluma has carried one or more International Dark Sky Association certified models. If your customer cares about light pollution, suggest the Omnimax with shielding or the Area Max with full cutoff to reduce uplight and glare. Evluma, illuminating the pursuit of darkness.